like to share the path to true self-confidence with you all. Self-confidence stems from believing in oneself and serve as a, as a significant driving force in all of our actions. People at various points in their lives, starting from childhood, often face situations that lead to a loss of self-confidence. In many cases, one's focus shifts consciously or unconsciously from oneself to others, comparing oneself to those who possess what one lacks or excel in areas where one falls short. Unknowingly, feeling inferiority and the desire can grow rapidly, leading to self-deprecation and living a life that falls short of one's desires. I too have experienced such times and observed the inner worlds or minds of people. And I've come to understand that one of the saddest things in the world is when a person does not believe in themselves. In September, I introduced you to the Hwadu or Kwan. Do you remember? On the winding road up on up Pyeongsan, a rock sits listening to the sound of a stream. Nothing, nothing, but no nothing either. Not, not, but not, not either. I told you to embark on a journey to discover this realm. Breaking free from the false self we have created in our minds. However, that awakening alone is not enough. Self-confidence is formed through awakening and practice. There are numerous methods to boost self-confidence as shared by YouTubers or psychologists. But today, I want to introduce what I believe to be the most realistic and scientifically backed way to improve self-confidence through changing one's actions, the practice of mindfulness in one Buddhism. How do you all perceive mindfulness? Mindfulness. It could mean different things to different people, such as not forgetting or fully concentrating on a present moment. During this time, I want to discuss what mindfulness practice means in one Buddhism, why it's important and explore some specific techniques. First, I'll provide some doctrinal background on mindfulness in one Buddhism. The founding master, Sotesan, attained great enlightenment at the age of 26. Observing the suffering in society and the difficult lives of people, he deeply contemplated for four years in Pyeongsan, Korea seeking ways to make this world a better place and save all sentient beings. His deep inquiry led to the, the establishment of the doctrines of one Buddhism, including, as you know, the truth of Irwan, the fourfold grace, the four essentials, the threefold study, and the eight articles. The founding master not only expounded these principles, but also made them accessible to everyone through the principal book of One Buddhism, Chapter 3, Practice. The founding master stated, when the period of right dharma returns, however, all people will again be trained realistically with simple doctrines and convenient methods and each and every person will be guided under the right dharma that is transmitted by speech and received by mind so that they will experience and awaken to that great way. What then would be the point of studying all the five cards of books 
and reading the entire 80,000 pages of sutras. His teachings emphasize the simplicity of the doctrines and the practical nature of the path to enlightenment. He intended for everyone to have access to the teachings and apply them in their daily lives. The founding master, in order to guide everyone on a path of, path of enlightenment, summarized the doctrines very simply and easily into the nine articles of the essential dharmas of daily practice that we recite every day. I first memorized this when I was very young, and for about 20 years, I just kept in, in my memory as a knowledge. But however, as I continued to study and practice, I came to understand the deeper intention of the founding master. The founding master said, it is intended to help you grasp their meanings in your hearts and assess it in your minds reviewing them generally once a day, and more specifically, examining them each time you are faced with sensory conditions. And he said, you must assess and check your mind over and over. It's quite challenging for us to do, with, to do this without forgetting in every moment. Even when we resolve to do it, it's easy to forget. He said, it's said that a person's mind is so subtle, extremely subtle, that it exists when you take hold of it, but disappears when you let it go. How then can a person cultivate one's mind without checking it? Without checking, the mind cannot be cultivated. The process of checking the mind is the foundation of the mindfulness and self-confidence. So what is mindfulness? There's a paper before you. Please read the word mindfulness, only the first sentence, mindfulness, written on a paper. Mindfulness refers to acting with heedfulness in making choices with regard to items that you resolved either to do or not to do. In simple terms, it means acting with heedfulness in making choices with sound thoughts with regard to items that you resolved either to do or not to do. Please also read the mindfulness, mindfulness, the third one. Mindfulness means to know numinously and behave correctly in a state that is free from any sense of attachment. This is the mind that takes suitable measure while harboring no thoughts. Master Chung San said, mindfulness means to know numinously and behave correctly in a state that is free from any attachment. This is mind that takes suitable measure while harboring no thoughts. This means cultivating a mind that is free from any attachment, not only during Dharma service, chanting or sit in meditation, but in every moment, ensuring that our minds do not stray from our self-nature. In this universe, there exists something called the void and calm, numinous awareness. It's empty and devoid of anything, but it's filled with boundless radiance and there is nothing unknown within it. Remarkably, this exists within each of our minds too. We call this is the mind that takes suitable measure while harboring the thoughts. What does this mean? Let's say, for example, I'm going to a grocery store to buy tomatoes and bananas. But on my way, I spot a biscuit that I really like. My mind, without me even realizing it, gets drawn to the biscuits. And I might end up forgetting why I came there in the first place. If I don't take suitable measure properly, I could get distracted and keep forgetting my original purpose as I'm drawn from one thing to another. 
However, if I continuously repeat tomatoes, bananas, tomatoes, bananas, tomatoes, bananas, in my mind like mantras, I'll probably stick to just one, just th those items. But that's not how our practice works. That's an attachment. Instead, it involves recognizing that your mind might be drawn as you enter the store and taking thorough measure of only whether or not you are affected by that sensory condition. In that moment of being drawn, you become aware and gently bring your mind back. Cultivating this realm of numinous awareness within our minds is what mindfulness practice is all about. And it's not as difficult as it may seem. On the other hand, on mindfulness, it's in, in simple terms, please read together, on mindful and on mindfulness too. On mindful refers to acting without heedfulness in making choices. On mindfulness means to be deluded and behave foolishly in a state that is enticed by a sense of attachment. This is the mind that, while harboring thoughts, does not know how to take suitable measure. In essence, it signifies thinking a lot, but being enticed and attached to sensory conditions in all actions. Then why do we sometimes fail to be mindful or become unmindful? While there are many individual reasons, common factors include desires or habits. Negligence can also be a contributing cause. It's about not tending to my, our minds or not checking our minds from the first. The true scriptures are within our minds. So shall we investigate the, co the causes by observing our minds? What leads you to lose mindfulness and become unmindful in your particular circumstances. There are many types of mindfulness practice, but today we'll delve into one of the most fundamental tools, mindfulness and unmindfulness examination practice. Step one, we'll go together. Step one, choose a mindfulness and unmindfulness item. You can see the table, right? Choose a mindfulness and all mindfulness item. Good examples of mindfulness items include cultivating a positive habit you want to develop or to breaking a negative habit. These items can be based on real life issues you're facing or your current state of mind. It's also good practice to prepare for upcoming sensory conditions that have not yet arisen. So take a moment to write your mindfulness item on a paper. Choosing mindfulness items related to your immediate surroundings is more recommended for beginners. take your time after the service. <laughs> so the example of the items can be stop mind functioning when discri discrimina discriminating mind arises. And step two, when the chosen situation arises, don't forget the items you've chosen. 
and check whether you practice mindfulness or not. For example, if your mi mindful item is getting up immediately when a morning alarm rings, no snooze, you can check it once a, once a day, just O and X. Or if your item is something like quick one minute meditation for scattered matter, scattered focus, then you can record each time you do it using a tally like this, tally, <laughs> or other methods. There are various ways to keep track of your mindfulness items. The founding master suggests a bean count method of examination in which I di divide the day into four parts and check whether I was mindful or not by each designated time. The founding master emphasized that initially simply recognizing the mindfulness items, oh, my mindfulness item is this, and checking whether you remember them or not, or not is the first step. And over time, as your practice becomes more consistent, then getting the desired results is considered as mindfulness. And step three, you assess whether you've carried out the items you resolved to do or not to do. If your asked your task deviated from your premeditated pl premeditated plan, you analyze the reasons for the decrepancy. You re-examine the path your past actions have taken and the framework within which future actions will unfold. And you go through the process of mindfulness preparation again. In the case of being count method, I count the number of the mindfulness and unmindfulness beans with different colors and assess whether I practice mindfulness. When mindfulness beans are more plentiful, then I acknowledge that I was mindful on the day. And when unmindful beans, unmindfulness beans more, I reflect on what might have gone wrong and plan for improvement. You can track your progress on a daily, weekly, and monthly basis. This systematic approach allows you to study in advance and pause your mind to make choices with sound thought, ensuring you don't forget the plans you've made. I'm still a work in progress, but I'd like to share one example of my practice of mindfulness. I was not always good at keeping my space organized. I knew how to do it, but I struggled with maintaining the habit consistently. I often left clothes lying around, misplaced objects, and created clutter in my room. However, when I felt more stable, then I would tidy up, tied up in my living space. This was my cycle. I wanted to change, but I often made excuses like, I'm feeling very tired now, so I cannot do that. <laughs> but seven years ago, seven years ago, my younger sister unexpectedly visited my place, suddenly, which was a disheveled state. I was taken aback and felt embarrassed. I thought that she probably thought of me as a someone who was good at organizing, and this will disappoint her. Strangely, my sister seemed unaffected and suggests we chant for a while and after a brief chant, Namo Amitabha sometimes, she said, let's clean up. <laughs> and started tidying up. From that time, I made up my mind to break free from this cycle. I realized that the state of my room directly reflected my state of mind. So I began by choosing the mindfulness item of placing items back in their designated <laughs> place. When a feeling of laziness arises while hanging up the clothes on a hanger, without any thought, I immediately pose to recognize that feeling and proceed to check and assess my mindfulness item, which I promised to myself. Then the mindfulness count increases by one. 
although there were many instances of being on mindfulness in the beginning with continued checking and assessing, I eventually rolled the thought based on sound spirit, even in those brief moments, how to make tidy space. I examine my current state of mind, the surroundings, and the times as sometimes there isn't any physical time. So I immediately make resolution to choose in action. I record this in my diary, reflecting on my mind. Even in recent times, when my mind was under considerable stress and experiencing great challenges, I found myself reluctant to tie up my space. Thoughts such as, I don't feel like organizing right now, Recognizing that state of mind and recalling the promise I made to myself, I realized that if I were to yield to that state of mind, the cycle of negativity would start again. So considering the time available to me and condition of my body, I made the decision to change the room layout. Over two days, I planned two days and put it into action. I moved the bed to the sunnier spot, not to be depressed, and created a comfortable resting area in one corner of my room. The method was truly simple. Following the principle Master Chung San taught us, to know numinously and behave correctly in a state that is free from any attachment. This is a mind that takes suitable measure while harboring no thoughts. I put it into practice. If I had obsessed over cleaning with thoughts like, I must tie it up, I must tie it up, I must tie it up, it would have only added anxiety and made execution much harder. However, by setting mindfulness items as my commitment and having a mindset of the mind that takes sort of measure, I could in instantly recognize when my mind was being drawn to old habits and would check and assess jotting down in my genre repeatedly. This allows me to witness the transformation in my daily life and mindset. The strength gradually accumulated through this process instilled tremendous self-confidence in me whenever I engage in any task. Moreover, I realize that with this newfound strength, I can do more beneficial deeds for others and publics. Venerable Chasan, the fourth head Dharma master in one Buddhism, who wished the one Buddhist broadcasting station, dedicated 30 years of consistent practice in the practice of mindfulness. He said, he succeeded in the goal, but he said before that he really, really consi consistently practiced for 30 years for that. He said, practicing mindfulness inconsist inconsistently, if you are on and off, is like letting it grow moldy and eventually losing, it, losing its usefulness. On the other hand, being consistent in your practice, day in and day out, will allow it to mature and grant you significant abilities. It will also benefit those around you. I believe that no matter how complex the world may be now, when each individual applies these teachings and change themselves, they can have a positive impact on their families, societies, nations, and the world. The most precious thing in the world is belief in oneself. I hope to practice with you to realize a checking mind Build a, true, build a true self-confidence and inspire others with your newfound strength. Thank you for listening. Mm -hmm.